So it's nice to be here in front of you. I would like to thank the organizers of this workshop for inviting me. So this talk is really a kind of users or developer, application developer point of view uh, about what can be done with these nice machines. <clears throat> so I would like to acknowledge the collaborations we have not only within our institute but also with other institute like the Max Planck in, in Germany and the University of Warwick in the UK. I should mention also that two of our staff here uh, are supported by the VHPUC project and I would like really to acknowledge that. The picture you have in the background here is actually uh, already a result, an example of turbulence. You have to imagine here there is a very hot plasma, maybe 200 million degrees, and up there in the upper left you have a colder plasma, maybe only 1 million degrees or so. You have gradients, and therefore you have instabilities, therefore you have turbulence. What you see here is just a snapshot, it's a small portion actually of a much bigger simulation I'm going to talk about. So here is the beast. The beast is ITER, it's this machine. I'm going also to tell you more precisely what it is. So we have the very hot plasma in there, a cold plasma out there. And this is just a snapshot. This is just a 2D snapshot actually across a 3D wheel field. And you see immediately from there, by, if I tell you that this cross section here has more grid points than pixels in the figure. So there is one million grid points on this one, but it's actually a three-dimensional grid which has one billion grid points. And actually it's even worse than that because we are dealing with collision dense plasma, so we have to deal with phase space. So not only real space, the three dimension in real space, configuration space, but two additional velocity space variables. So we have actually a five-dimensional space. And we have here for that particular simulation uh, two billion particles. What, what are the scales here in this color? Sorry, this is called two orders, but this is just a snapshot of, um, uh, of a perturbed uh, density perturbation caused by the turbulence. Okay, but what, I don't understand what the scales are. I mean, you get oh, this is in units, sorry, this is in, in units of the sound speed. So this is the velocity that, that <coughs> is actually a, a velocity of the fluid, and the, the, the unit here is a Mach number of fluid of the perturbation. So, and this the scale here is the scale in the quantity I'm going to talk about the, the gyration radius of the, of the ions that gives actually the scale. So the outline of my talk is as follows. Uh, I, I will give a, a short motivation of actually why we are doing these things, what is fusion, what is a tokamak, and why turbulence is an important thing to study. We are going, we're going to mention the scalability issues with physical system size that has an impact on kind of weak like scalability, if you wish, on the, on the, on the computer. And then I will uh, uh, show you an example um, how we de dealt with the way uh, improve performance thanks to this uh, HP2C project <coughs> and then I will show you some results, physical results, but this will be only a slideshow, I will not do a, a physics lecture here. <coughs> so, fusion. It's magnetic fusion. What do we do in magnetic fusion? You take deuterium and lithium in and what gets out is helium and energy. There is fuel literally everywhere. And the outcome, helium is neither radioactive, it's not a greenhouse gas. Uh, there is, of course, neutrons in, the, in this reaction, but uh, they act and deactivate radioactivity the, the, the vacuum vessel and the elements around the, the reactor, but these are made of low activation material with short period. The deuterium tritium, actually, we use tritium in, this, in the core of the reactor, with tritium which is recycled on the site. Used in the DT reaction, which produces a neutron, which then impacts a blanket, which produces by another nuclear reaction the, the tritium, and tritium recycled. To give, to give you an idea, the, the machine that I showed you, this ITER, is uh, uh, approximately uh, 1 million liters, <coughs> and uh, 
and the weight of the fuel is 0.3 grams. So we have a reactor where the fuel content is 0.3 grams. Very important. The total size of tritium inventory is 1 or 2 kilograms. There are neutrons in this reaction, but they are totally uh, useless for the nuclear reaction. They don't intervene as a nuclear chain reaction. And even in the case of a maximum conceivable accidents, there is no population evacuation required, given in part also because of these low numbers here. And I should mention also there is, it's maybe important, I think, uh, these days, or well, always, in fact, there is an extremely weak nuclear proliferation risk. There, none of the materials that come to building a, a magnetic fusion reactor is a material which is has an entry in the non-proliferation treaty. Another convincing argument, I hope, is that that type of research was declassified in 1958, and that was the middle of the Cold War. So if there were any chance that this research would have you know, some nasty impact on nuclear proliferation, I think it would not have been declassified, especially in those days. Yeah? So ITER. ITER is a project where basically the whole world, well, almost the whole world, uh, EU, plus Switzerland, Japan, US, China, India, South Korea, Russia, have teamed up to build this device. Uh, the, the, the construction cost is of course large. In some sense it's order of magnitude 10 million euros, uh, which means 30 centimes per person per year of those citizens of those countries. So it's large or small, depending on the point of view. It's large from another point of view, the physical system size. Here is a Homo sapiens standard, you know, the scale of the machine. Uh, I will not be interested in what is here, I will be interested in what is not here, namely a vacuum. Here is basically vacuum that you do first, and you put a tiny bit of plasma inside. The plasma will be here, and ITER uh, actually works on the principle uh, the tokamak. Tokamak is a Russian acronym for toroidal magnetic chamber with coils. The idea is to produce a magnetic field which has this topology of nested magnetic surfaces on which each individual magnetic field line not only goes around the, the large way but is also twisted in a helical torsion, what we call the rotational transform of this field. And the presence of this rotation is actually essential to confine part. Plasma, that's those temperatures, I mean, it's a plasma, namely any, any substance at those temperatures we are talking about is ionized, so therefore it's charged, therefore it feels the magnetic field. If I make a cross section here um, and, 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 and look at particle trajectories, they have these shapes, elliptical shapes, they follow more or less the magnetic surfaces in blue. Not exactly, they are drifts, the particles skid away in or out, but in this configuration, you can actually show mathematically that the particle, single particle trajectory is confined. If I zoom around one of these trajectories, I will have this helical motion of a single particle. With here, this scale, which is important physically, this is the Larmor rate scale, the gyration of the charged particle in this magnetic field. So, from the single, uh, single particle physics point of view, we could build a reactor almost on a desk. A desktop. But of course, reality is more complex than that. Particles are not single, they are, even though the medium is very thin, there are many particles. They are very, they are collisions. So, so these particles will collide, they will interact with each other, but they are very weakly collisional, contrary to the air we are breathing at the moment. The temperature is about 300,000 times the standard atmosphere, whereas the density is about 100,000 of the standard atmosphere, which makes up for a pressure of three bars. Okay, that's the pressure of your tires in your bike or car, to give you an idea of the, the things. But at those temperatures and densities, you can calculate the mean free path of a charge particle. And that's in excess of one kilometer. Okay? The particles, fortunately, they tend to follow the magnetic field lines. So they go round and round and round the machine many, 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 many times in this system of size of 10 meters. So they span a large fraction of the magnetic field configuration. And therefore, they somehow feel 
the effect of this magnetic field well before the effect of interparticle collisions are felt. So the geometry of the magnetic field, which is essential to get single particle motion, is also affecting the collective effects, in particular turbulence, we are going to see, I'm going to show an example of that. Uh, the other consequence of those typical parameters is that kinetic effects are important. I mean, fluid models are insufficient, or I should say, very often insufficient to describe the phenomena that happens in such systems. Another consequence is that collisions are weak, but there are unfortunately uh, losses of heat uh, across this, uh, this device. The magnetic field is not perfectly uh, thermal insulator, and this is due, the, the main loss time is due to turbulence, this collective effect uh, which develop turbulence, which leads to a degradation of the, the quality of the confinement, and therefore we need large, large enough system size physical system size for achieving economical fusion. Okay, the time scales in this ether plasma, they, they span so many orders of magnitude, uh, uh, from the, the shortest time scale, the electron motion, to the machine lifetime. Uh, turbulence, we are going to talk about, still spans a reasonable number of orders of magnitude, but it's still tractable. But anyway, we cannot hope, even with exascale computing, to make a direct numerical simulation of everything. It's just unthinkable. So we need to separate the time scales by using a physics-based approximation. Fortunately, the turbulence that appears in our systems happens at relatively low frequencies. So with the frequencies typically much smaller than the generation frequency of a charged particle. So we can uh, somehow average out this fast motion of the particle around what we call the guiding center as if this small helix was actually like a circle guided by a center. In this sketch here you have in blue the particle trajectory, in green the magnetic field line and the gyro center trajectory in, in, in uh, I think it's the other way around, but well, anyway, you, you, see, you see the meaning. And in the end, actually, you describe in gyro center space, now this line, a motion which is still quite fast in the parallel direction to the magnetic field, but this slow drifts in the direction perpendicular to the, to the field. And therefore, instead of a six-dimensional phase space, or so three for x, y, z, if you wish, and uh, three for velocity, we can reduce the phase space dimensions to only, quote unquote, 5D. Okay, so we have to describe a 5D system. With usually, this is done with what we call a distribution function for some species, so ion or electron, function of position, function of parallel velocity, and nu is actually the magnetic moment that, that represents this perpendicular velocity. Okay? So we have to solve for this distribution function in five dimensions. The basic equation is kind of advection diffusion, it's a PDE in 5D, like that, okay? And with, with uh, the, the terms here, dr by dt, dv by dt, depend on the electromagnetic fields. I don't write the explicit expressions here, not to bother you, but we need to solve these equations of motion orbits. These are ordinary differential equations in this five-dimensional space. And we need to solve the fields, solution of Maxwell's equations, and those are given by a set of PTEs in 3D. So that's the basic uh, method. Uh, which we can apply, and I'm going to talk more specifically about one of the codes we have developed, it's a CRPT, EFL, that we call 5 code. So, for, to discretize the 5D phase space, we use the particle instead approach. For the 3D field solver, cubic displaying cubic elements, the time stepping is the only <coughs> force order. Uh, with particle-based method, you, you face uh, a sampling noise problem, so we need to reduce it. And this is done with various control variant schemes, like the delta F scheme, where we project only the perturbed part. And <coughs> with a filter line Fourier filter, we eliminate unphysical modes, which come actually just from the particle representation of our distribution function. So we need Fourier in, in here, we come back to that. We need also to control the noise. Uh, by applying some uh, operators, uh, coke like operators. We have also introduced a uh, coarse graining scheme in the, in, the, in the code. 
The parallelization scheme, well, this is good old uh, Fortran MPI, right? It's still, yeah, that's it, yeah. <laughs> These are two main techniques, domain decomposition and domain cloning. It has been developed in-house uh, with contributions from the Max Planck and the uh, University of Warwick, mainly. I don't know what domain cloning is. Sorry? What is domain cloning? I, I, I have a slide on that explaining yeah, in, in a moment. Uh, <clears throat> so, about system size now. Uh, here is a control plot of some instability in a cross section. It's still a cross section inside the plasma, so the center of the plasma is hot, it's weak. There is an instability that's developing, and here we have done the simulation at one tenth of the size of eta. And then we can do the same at uh, two tenths of eta, and then four tenths of eta, and then 80% of the eta size. What you see on these plots is that the basic size of the instability across here is more or less invariant. The figures are approximately to scale. So this means the more, the larger the system size, the more those grid points you will need to have and the more particles you will need to have. So this is uh, important because here is um, uh, the, the heat transport that you that you can compute, so due heat transport due to this turbulent process versus the system size in normalized units. So this is the system size of the plasma cross-section, or uh, minor radius as we call it, in units of the ion gyro radius. And just to give you an idea, ITER will be in this range, whereas tokamaks nowadays are more in this range. And you see that the heat transport scales differently for existing experiments than for ITER. This is actually quite a good news that this heat flux increase actually saturates at some point and ITER will be here. So uh, this is an important result from, uh, say, uh, first principle based uh, simulation of tran uh, turbulent transport because simple empirical extrapolations from existing experiments might lead to totally wrong conclusion up there that ITER uh, will not ignite or so uh, now uh, we need therefore to be ITER relevant to, to have a com computer simulation that deals with such large system. And with a particle in cell code, uh, you need to discretize the 3D uh, field grid. So the, the cost at, at best uh, will be scale like the linear system size, size is linear system size, to the cube. And therefore, the number of particles for the 5D uh, discretization will also scale like the cube. The number of times that, for some reason, I don't want to discuss, uh, scale with uh, the linear system size to the 1 power. And therefore, if you just make the multiplication, this means the computational cost will go like linear system size to the fourth power. And that becomes uh, really uh, very quickly uh, prohibitive. So, what we have done with our code is to think about the physics, and actually the physics, and I'm going to show you an example, that the perturbations in this turbulence tend to be aligned with the magnetic field. So we have designed a kind of intelligent Fourier filter, which automatically aligns uh, the perturbation with, with the field, and filters out the unphysical uh, perturbations. And with this, we have still size to the cube dependence for the 3D field rate. The number of particles now, instead of to the cube, can scale to the size to the square. And most of these, at least, the CPU operation, floating point operation, are with particles, not with billion of particles. The computational cost, therefore, for particle operation is size to the square. And the 3D field, actually, uh, what dominates this calculation is the communication. And this scale still like size to the third power. So the exercise we have been doing is to re remove this kind of bottleneck that limits the parallel scalability for large number of processors and large system size. Because it's again a term which is usually small. If you, if you do a small system, it does not appear. But if you want to simulate it there, this blows to your face, basically. So uh, how it would did we do it? And now uh, comes uh, the, uh, the question about parallel, parallelization scheme that we use. We use domain decomposition. So
So what is represented here symbolically are processors and symbolically the particles that those processors uh, do the computation of. And the arrows signify that in time these particles will move around. Okay? So we slice actually our physical domain, our tokomak, in slices and <coughs> assign a certain number of particles to each processor. Of course, in the, in the course of the simulation, some particle will, have, will move from one processor to the other, and therefore you have to shift, shift data around. Fortunately, this happens mostly between nearest neighbors, so we found this is not the biggest bottleneck. But you cannot go indefinitely. I mean, you, you want to run at tens of thousands of processors at least, and uh, you cannot, uh, there is some point where even this will kill your, your, your simulation. So what we do is precisely domain cloning. So we take the, the field data, which is there, and we replicate it. So for each domain, so this small cylinder represents the field data on which the electromagnetic fields are presented. And we just replicate it over processors. And we assign different particles now to this uh, process. Okay? This is domain cloning. It's very simple. It's parallelization over particles. This is grid over the grid, and this is over the particles. Now, in terms of communications, you need, of course, to evaluate what is, for example, the perturbed density at some point in time, because you need that to solve for the field. Therefore, the, the, the field data has to be summed up across the clones. These are the clones, vertical, and these, these are the domains. So we have communications here and there. Plus we have something else I talked about, is the, uh, this Fourier stuff. So we need to do a Fourier transform in this direction, and this requires, of course, a parallel data transport because of that. And this, what I circled here, and that proved to be the main bottlenecks to extrapolation to, I mean, for large system size. So what we have done as an exercise in, this, in the frame of this easy to see uh, project was to, to, to do an in-depth performance analysis. And the main findings, so, so we examined, of course, the, uh, what is the data locality, what are the communication bottlenecks. And here we have on this table, these are, these, these are the world of the particles, and then the particles have to be projected on the grid to obtain the charge density, and then the grid in real space to Fourier space, and actually the solver itself is in Fourier space. So we have to push particles, this is purely local, we have to shift them from one to the nearest neighbor, it's global, but actually as I said, nearest neighbors almost over the domains, and we have to shift particle data. From particle to grid, we have to sum across the processors. This is a global operation, but over, over the clone. So clone by clone, you have to sum uh, in, the, in the different domains. So it's not really all the all. It's all, all clones have to come. In. And then you have to do this, uh, uh, that parallel data transpose, and uh, reassemble the data. And again, here this is a global operation over the, over the clones. So precisely the clone was a was a problem. So uh, here is a view of um, the 3D uh, system topology of processor that's on Palu, and this is uh, uh, we have identified here with circles, for example, four clones of the same grid domain, and over which, in fact, the processors had to sum up, hmm, to make a global sum. And you see, they happen to be, if you run on a cluster, they can be anywhere in your cluster. And this leads not only to not very efficient, uh, a global sum problem, but also made it even to load in balancing because uh, depending on the, where the clones are, uh, on another domain it might be elsewhere and so on and so forth. So what we do, having seen that, we try to extract from the code, this big code, some uh, kernels. Uh, so a subset of routines, uh, speaking from the big code, that deal with those operations. These are essentially these 3D grid data communications. And we have optimized the kernels first. So here is a picture, so this is uh, warp clock time on vertical axis, and the horizontal axis is number of clones. This was done on the PALU, the, uh, the create, this is PALU. 
And those are the, the computing types, so increasing number of clones, you see it's absolutely bad because you still uh, uh, it's even worse than horrible because you have to increase the computing type by increasing the number of processors, so it's not, not very good scaling. And between the old kernel and the new kernel, which now scales much better, you see we have eliminated many of those operations, mainly in the global sum, here in pink, and replaced uh, them with all gather operations, they are down there, and we have also worked on the... And you see the other part, the FFT uh, itself is uh, for for almost negligible. Okay, so we are happy with the kernel, you have to put the kernels back in the code, and here is how, <coughs> here is how it looks, so this is a strong <coughs> Sorry, strong scaling on the on the Monte Rosa from 8,000 to 32,000. The, the old version, uh, sorry, the old version speed up in, in pink and the new one in blue. You see, uh, strong scalability is improved from 72% to 90%. Okay, it's maybe not so critical, but this scaling has been done. Uh, on a grid which is 500 times 1000 times 1000 and 6 billion particles. Actually, that's not enough for ITER. Unfortunately, we need to go four times bigger than this. So, here is now the, the result. Uh, <coughs> that's the old version, so the time per time step, and the old, I mean, before optimization and after optimization, both with 32 clones. And this time on a grid which is relevant for ITER size simulation. And there is, we have, thanks to this uh, HP2C project, we have gained a factor of two. And uh, that was very uh, uh, helpful, uh, really, to us. Uh, so what happened uh, recently for our project is that uh, we could get access to 1.5 petaflop platform, that's the Helios platform that is situated in, in northern Japan. Uh, it's a... Uh, 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 computer dedicated to magnetic fusion research for uh, European, including Switzerland and Japan. Uh, it is, I think, number 12 on the top 500 uh, <coughs> list. And our code was actually one among four codes designed as a high-level benchmark used for the acceptance test of this machine for capability testing. And it has demonstrated strong scalability on that machine from uh, roughly speaking, one quarter of the full machine size, so 16,000 core to 64,000 core, which is almost a full machine, with a speed up of 3.36 or 84% power and efficiency. So, confirming what I said before. For a case which we submitted, which is relevant for ITER simulation. And uh, uh, we were very lucky to get uh, to obtain an allocation of several million uh, CPU hours. And this has allowed us to perform the first global geokinetic turbulence simulations of ITER. <coughs> so here they are, ITG turbulence in ITER. Uh, here is just, a, again, this is a cross-section of turbulence. This is just to give you a, a flavor of the things we are being able to solve. So what you see in the background is a cross-section of the plasma. And what you see here is a particular magnetic surface in ITER and as contours, what is represented is once more the perturbed density due to the turbulence. So the hot plasma is somewhere here in the core and the cold plasma in the periphery. And, what, and you, you see something that here you have quite small scales uh, which are comparable to the, this normal radius scale. On the other hand, on the magnetic surface, you see that that the perturbations are extremely elongated. We have a problem with an isotropy of 1,000 or something like that. No? <coughs> so, uh, again, sorry. And we were able even to do some uh, interesting physics with it. Uh, that's the good news. So again, this cross-section of ITER plasma with the hot plasma here. This is again just a snapshot what we have observed is that, this is already known, we have not discovered this, that turbulence uh, itself, uh, through nonlinear coupling mechanism, 
actually generates zonal flows. What are zonal, zonal flows? You have probably all, uh, all of you seen pictures of the Jupiter atmosphere with these bands of clouds. And these bands of clouds have velocities which uh, uh, are in, op uh, in opposite direction, alternating bands of, of flows. And this is actually happening. There are bands of flows here uh, which tend to shear these turbulent eddies. You, you can imagine that each of these red or, or, or blue spots is a kind of like cyclone, anticyclone, and the plasma is just moving around these things. This is a turbulent motion in which we transport then hot plasma to the, <coughs> from the inside to the outside and bring in colder plasma to the inside, and that's the mechanism for transport. But now, thanks to the shearing effect of those zonal flows, you see that this uh, splits the turbulence patterns, so there is a, a self-organization with a, a radial structure appearing with alternating bands of zonal flows related to regions of suppressed turbulence. There are regions here, uh, here, where turbulence has a very low amplitude and then high amplitude again and low amplitude again and actually uh, if you suppose that to the zonal flow pattern this is really due to this zonal flow interaction. And what we have found of interest, this was known, this is quite generic uh, in, all, uh, in almost all of our turbulence in plasmas. But what we have discovered is that uh, the shaping, the particular shape of the ether makes it more effective for the zonal flows to suppress turbulence. And therefore, as a result, as compared to a circular cross section plasma, you see those. The dashed lines are the magnetic surface and they are elongated. The whole machine is elongated in ITER. It's not just circles like the first Tokamax uh, <coughs> that were built. And the, the end result is as follows. <coughs> uh, well, just a comparison here of uh, ITER, this is ITER cross-section, and a very similar uh, simulation, but just we change the, the shape of the background magnetic field. And on the left, it's for the same temperature so it's, it's really fair comparison if you wish. Same temperature inside and outside, the same temperature gradient, everything, only the shape is changed here. And you see that the ITER case exhibits this um, radial corrugation or this really uh, strong modulation or suppression of turbulence, which does not appear as much in the circular case. And as a result, if you compute the heat flux uh, associated with this turbulence, well, uh, I have just a few. How much time is, do I have left? Oh, there's still time. There's still 10 minutes until the discussion. Okay, very good. Okay, so uh, just uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, just again to, to give you a flavor of the difference between this elongated plasma or ether plasma and the circular plasma, I show you now. Uh, this is a little bit more abstract plot, but nevertheless, I think it's understandable. What is represented here is a 2D plot, but it's in space here. And this is the core of the plasma, and this is the edge of the plasma. And the horizontal axis is time. And the quantity that is represented by this color code here in some units um, is actually the shearing rate of the zonal flow. Shearing rate, so basically the radial derivative of the zonal flow velocity. It, it's a kind of measure at which rate the zonal flow will shear the turbulent eddies and therefore suppress turbulence. And what we see is a zoo of phenomena, which I don't have, I don't have the time to describe, but which is very interesting. If you look from very far or, or, or blurred vision, you see those stripes here, which are uh, somehow reminiscent of this Jupiter structure of zonal flows. It's very similar in fact. They are strong analogy, and the, the, the fact that you can see them uh, on a long time means these zonal flow structures can survive for a long time. Really like the, the Jupiter atmosphere. These bands survive since I don't know how many years, probably since we have observed them. Uh, and uh, this, this, this is the same in ether here, turbulence. Whereas if you take the smaller planets, our planets, we have zonal flows in the atmosphere, these are the jet streams. The jet streams, they don't stay always in the same position. They are a little bit less, uh, you know, 
less stable in some sense, less robust. And this is exactly what happens in circular plasma. So the next slide will be exactly the same quantity, but for circular plasma, and you will see just qualitative difference immediately. Here, here is the picture, and you see, okay, if you look from very far and half close your eyes, you see maybe zones like here or here, which survive sometimes, but they, they don't stay for very long. So this is more like the, the jet stream of the Earth's atmosphere. And what is uh, really um, kind of amazing is that this is obtained just by sh changing the shape of the background magnetic field. This is something you don't find at all in normal fluid. Normal fluid, the shaping of the boundary is, of course, extremely important, as we all know. But here it's not just the shape of the boundary, it's the shape of the volume. And it's inside, it's everywhere. It's really the, 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 the shape inside. So that, and the reason is because we are in a very um, uh, moderate collision, or very almost collisionless system, and particles have really time to feel this uh, magnetic geometry. And what is amazing is that it has an impact on something as chaotic as turbulence a priori. By the way, for this question of reproducibility of the results, it's exactly as was said by the previous speakers, is that if you run two simulations with the same code, with the same exactly the same compiler and on the same platform with the same number of processors, the same everything you make two runs, you obtain two different results. After some time. And that's because this system is chaotic. <laughs> and meaning that any infinitesimal difference at some point, because of exponential diverging Typical of very, it's physical chaoticity, and it's not numerical chaoticity. Therefore, you have individual simulations which look all different. They look all different in their detail. But fortunately, you can make ensemble average. And I hope the climate modelers do the same, but I don't know. Uh, that's what we, we did. We didn't have the time to do the ensemble average of the simulation for those simulations, but for the smaller uh, system size. You have to do statistical average then to understand what is the climate. Huh? This is the climate in the local market. Huh? We are interested in averages. By the way. On average, how much trans heat transport will be uh, going away from the, from the plasma and so on and so forth. And the good news is that in spite of this uh, infinite <laughs> uh, sensitivity to initial conditions or to anything, the velocity of the wind outside, or the age of the captain, as we say in French. Uh, on average, you can make statistical average in meaningful sense and get a narrow bar, which is a narrow bar due to the chaoticity of the system. But now the interesting thing I was thinking is that if now in the simulator, if we have, say, a new algorithm, I implement some non-deterministic algorithm a bit, what will be the part of the error bar that I can compute which is due to this algorithmic feature and which one is due to the physics? Yeah, that's uh, maybe not so easy to, to, to answer. Anyway, uh, it would be uh, very interesting indeed and challenging for the future. So you see also many other phenomena here, uh, like these stripes here. Those are avalanches, avalanches propagating outwards or inwards. These are events that propagate from this region, for example, outwards. So they are triggered at some point here and propagate out, which means the transport of heat has been triggered here, but it's actually transporting uh, heat somewhere else. So transport is partly non-local, which is also another interesting feature. Okay, and the end result, what, what we have done, we have done a series of simulations, two series of simulations with various temperature gradient profiles. So the left figure shows you the temperatures, the unit, the, the, the top here. It's in units of a cap, so it's 40 kV here. And here is a 15 kV, so this is 150 million degrees, this is 400 million degrees. And we have run sets of simulations for increasing uh, values of the temperature gradient. And uh, in the end, the condensed results, it is as follows. So varying the temperature gradient here, Increasing the gradient, the background, 
we get this heat diffusivity in red for the circular plasma and in black for the ether shaped plasma. And it's really quite a substantial effect, I would say. So, uh, it's a really drastic reduction of heat transport, and that's good news, in fact, for ether. So now I conclude. So, uh, the first principle based so called direct numerical simulation of turbulence in magnetized plasma, uh, they remain a challenge. Uh, these simulations take uh, 100,000 core hours, which is reasonable, you could say. And uh, so our codes are ready for petafluoride platforms. And I must acknowledge that the, this HTC project was instrumental in helping us to get to this step. And what we see now is uh, as bottlenecks. This is not a big surprise, but the amount of data that you have to handle, analyze, and even visualize. I showed you only 2D and just one 3D, but it was just slices. And actually, we have a five-dimensional phase space. How do we extract information and even, even just to visualize in five dimensions? It's okay. So the speciality is not only grid data, it's also particle data. How, this is something perhaps special, and okay, we hope to progress in the future on this area as well. The amount of data is exploding, of course. We, we, we are not saving all the data. We cannot save So a lot of it is just wasted, if you wish. We cannot even afford to save all the particles data. It's impossible. Okay. So it's a kind of challenge for the future. And finally, on the physics, the, the, this first the global geomagnetic turbulence simulation, the BITER, uh, predicts um, a drastic reduction of turbulent infrastructure. And we think it's really due to plasma shape. This has to be, of course, confirmed. Thank you for uh, your attention.